Hello, greetings. Today I'm going to share about stations and rotations that have minimal prep, mineral, minimal materials, and can be used for garden care and classroom management, things like independent stations. I'm going to be doing that by sharing video clips, some direct links, and showing you screen shares of web pages, along with images. You'll find a handout to everything that I'm talking about at the web link bit.ly slash garden stations. So let me share my screen and I'll show you that web page URL. So there it is, bit.ly, bit.ly forward slash garden dash station. So that's where you're gonna find everything that I'm gonna to share today. So my name is John Fisher. I work with Life Lab. We're a 42 year old organization based on the University of California Santa Cruz farm. I started out there over 20 years ago, building that garden classroom site, running field trips and camps for kids. Um, now I'm involved more in adult education um, and running uh, networking among school garden support professionals. Uh, there's some contact information. You can see our social media handles at Life Lab Garden. And if you want to follow up more on Life Lab's resources, I would direct you to lifelab.org forward slash school gardens is a great place to start out. So our mission is to cultivate children's love of learning healthy food and nature through garden based education. And we do that through field trips and school based programs supporting educators and organizations that are working in school gardens. We have curriculum and teacher training on site virtually, or we can come to your site and inspire your educators. A lot of what I'm talking about today is stemming from my work as a garden educator at Pacific Elementary School in Davenport, California, where I spent seven years as the garden coordinator at that space. So as we move through today's presentation, um, think of these activities as um, the way I ran them were the beginning of my garden classes. We called them garden chores where kids would engage in the garden or doing some observation or some experimentation. That's one way we've done many of these activities when I was uh, coordinating and teaching these kids in the K-6 school. Um, other ways to use these stations and activities that we're going to share are for early finishers or independent stations or station rotations, which aid a lot in management. Um, and of course, depending on the age of your students and the frequency um, of, of their visits to the garden will determine their capacity of whether they can engage in particular activities or not. And I'll mention who and when I had different kids do different activities as we went through them. All right, so I'm gonna get ready to share our first act. So the first type of activity are observations. And these are great for tone setting to get kids like quote into the garden. So the first ones I'll just mention sit spots. That's just having a space where kids go every time they come back to the garden and they sit, depending on your student. It might be two minutes, it might be five minutes. They observe, you have rules where they don't need to bother other students or ideally they can't see other students and they're sitting in their own space, observing the garden from their space. And over time, they'll observe change that you can talk about. Um, another extension of that are hidden rocks where I had kids create their own pet rocks and they hide them in the garden. And then when they come back to the garden, they go look for their hidden rock and they just sit with it. You'd be surprised how many rocks actually moved among the garden, even if we tell the kids to hide them as best as they can. Um, so that could be an issue once a kid loses their rock. So you might want to talk about that before you engage in hiding a rock and having a kid not see their rock the next time they visit. Um, habitat boards are another um, way that we've done observation. And we did these with journal pages. Um, essentially, it was just a plywood board that sat in one corner of the garden. Um, sometimes I'd screw a handle on it so it was easier for the kids to lift it up. And I'd send a team of three or four kids to go observe what's under their board. Uh, what things that they observed were, were, for example, lizard skins or co colonies of ants or beetles. Um, they've also recognized the difference of leaf litter and or dew and the lack of dew. Um, and I'd put out multiple boards and I'd have teams at habitat board number one, number two, number three, number four, and have observation prompts for them, whether they're going to draw pictures or write about it or just check them out and come back and tell what they saw 
or didn't see under their board, but it's just a space for them to focus and practice the skill of observation, which is one of the practices that scientists use. Um, going deeper, this is one of my favorite activities where I had students, um, I would mark a dormant tree branch with blue tape or any tape and, and just have the kids focus on a few buds. And I'd said teams of two to go observe those buds over time as that tree went through its progression, right? From a bud that's dormant to a bud that opens up and then it may leaf out and may flower out and may turn into fruit. And over time, our students would take a look at these particular buds. I have a sample journal page that's on the handout um, and they'd observe what they were seeing. Once the plants were flowering, we'd have them count pollinators while they were watching and see if any were visiting. And of course the bees were coming to the flowers when the apple trees started to bloom. Um, and then once the trees started to have fruit, we gave them the job of thinning the fruit. Now apple trees, we don't wanna have a cluster of eight apples. We want two to three per cluster to encourage large fruiting and to deter um, alternate bearing years of fruiting, meaning if you don't thin your fruit trees, you might get a lot of fruit one year and then no fruit the next year. So thinning down to two or three clusters or two or three fruit per clusters, um, a great idea. So this was an observation that actually turned in to a caretaking task as well. Uh, this other observation here was part of the um, greatsunflowerproject.org which is a national um, observation or citizen science project where students observe a flower for a particular amount of time and count how many pollinators visit it. And so we would set our kids up to watch one particular flower or a team of two or a team of three to watch a particular flower for five minutes and they actually do it. And then after that, and after they filled out their tally sheet, um, they would discuss what they saw and they were so excited. They were truly acting as scientists. They were able to focus for those five minutes. And this is the data recording sheet that you can download. Um, and then you can upload your data to the great sunflower um, project.org um, at great sunflower.org. Um, and so these are the types of things I've had the kids, these are older kids, they filled out the data sheet, you know, the type of flower, how long did they observe, what time of the day, I had them collect wind and, and temperature data, which the Great Sunflower Project doesn't ask for, but we were extending this to make the kids be more engaged as scientists. Um, and then this was their tally sheet. So um, for every time a bee touched the flower that they were looking at or any of these pollinators, they'd put a, a tally mark and I taught them how to do one, two, three, four cross and they would tally on their sheets. So simple observation that got them observing the garden, acting like scientists. And in this case, they could upload the data to a national database through a citizen science project. All right. So now I'm gonna talk about the monitor, monitoring that we did with our students, meaning they would be in charge of monitoring elements of our garden for the purpose of care. So some real simple things that you can do, I don't have many slides or resources for, is a pest census and have the kids go out and count a particular um, bug or as many bugs as they can find in a particular region and record it and then go back and do that the next time you're in the garden. Um, you could also be looking for pest damage or you could be collecting uh, snails. We had a great snail hunt in our garden where we would collect the snails and record which grade levels collected the most snails and then a plaque was put up in the garden for the class that found the most snails. Um, and those snails were put in a bucket and brought offside and dealt with. Um, and uh, other things you can do is a weed census. So you could mark a particular area that a team of students have to look at in a garden bed. You could just make a square by taking um, rulers together and make a one by one square and have them set that out in a particular area and count the weeds. Or you can have all the kids count together weeds. If they're younger, you can go count weeds um, and as you count and then pull. Um, I like to call that micro weeding, looking for tiny weeds after showing the kids what a weed is, pulling the weeds before they're a centimeter tall is the way to do it. So really, really uh, micro observation, monitoring where the weeds are coming and then pulling them out. We've also had greenhouse managers. They were caretakers. The team would go into the greenhouse and there was a, um, a clipboard with the things they needed to do, like take the temperature and water the plants and sweep the greenhouse out. 
Um, we set up the chores that they could do independently that they took pride in doing and it was all written down on a particular uh, clipboard and they would run in there and do their job. Um, this next one, uh, Weather Station, uh, is an activity that we've done with all grade levels um, and they learned how to observe the weather. Uh, younger kids, kids need a little more support than older kids. Um, but I'm going to switch over and share a web page, this lifelab.org slash weather station, to share a little bit more um, about our weather station. So let me share the right screen here. All right. So this here is our weather station page on our LifeLab webpage. A little introduction has all the materials to make the weather stations that we make. Um, with links to the products, um, recommended tools, and detailed directions on how to do it. Um, and then additionally, we have all the um, resources, our weather data log, our cloud key, um, ideas on what else to do in terms of extensions and websites that talk about elementary school level weather study. Um, we also have a video that describes reading the minimum maximum thermometer um, and how we collect data. But let me bring you back and show you some of these um, elements up close. All right, so our weather station is a post. The cardinal directions um, are just mounted on the top of it. Um, we had uh, a minimum maximum thermometer, a windsock, a rain gauge, which we don't get a lot of rain in California. We didn't really have much rain data, but we do have a rain gauge on our on our um, weather station. We have a minimum maximum thermometer, um, which is linked to on the webpage. Um, on one side of the thermometer, it shows, um, it marks and records the highest temperature that the thermometer um, has hit. And then on the other side, it shows the lowest, thermo the lowest temperature that the thermometer has hit. Uh, watch the video for more. It's too much to uh, describe right now, but the video will tell you um, how to use a minimum maximum thermometer. We used a, um, just a, a kind of real estate um, brochure box to keep our um, weather clipboard. And our weather clipboard has on it um, a very basic cloud chart um, and our weather data. And the way that this chart is set up is it's really easy for a kid just to circle the data that they're collecting. So uh, the columns of the numbers are the current. And then if you have a minimum maximum thermometer, you can mark the high temperature and the low temperature. And then um, as a group, we would look at the sky and decide if it's cloudy, partly cloudy or clear. We'd look at the key of the cloud types and monitor um, or observe and record what kind of cloud type they thought it was. We'd look at the wind sock for wind speed. We'd look at the cardinal directions to see from which direction the wind came from. And the students, once they learned how to do this, they would do it on their own time. We put a weather station just in our play yard, not, you know, in addition to the garden, we have a weather station just in our school play yard. And the kids would go once they learned and they'd go and observe and track the weather and report it on the data sheet over time. All right, so here are some of the garden chores that we did. Um, I mentioned in observations um, that micro weeding would be something we do. I put it here in garden maintenance too, because after kids put out some transplants or started some seedlings, uh, they would love to visit their plants. And of course we wanna go see and observe and see uh, what might have changed over time. Um, and what we'd always make sure to do is to care for the plants when they're there. We'll send them wishes, we might pet the plants if we have really young kids. Um, and then we'd focus on pulling out all the small weeds, the ones that are under a centimeter tall, we just pull them out. Um, and that would be really great. Many hands make light work. Um, and we're sharing that responsibility with the kids to be caretakers of their plants. So I'd call it micro weeding. We'd visit the garden plants to observe and then all together pull out any weed that we saw. Um, another um, great activity for young kids is worm care. Um, and that involves just weeding the worms, or excuse me, feeding the worms. Um, but on our webpage, we also have some links to um, worm bin bingo cards where you take a pile of worm compost or just normal compost um, and the kids search and seek within that sample of 
uh, compost to see if they could find any of the critters that are on the worm bin bingo card. So that is an independent station. Once they learn how to play, um, it's kind of just like a scavenger hunt on the micro level. Um, these other activities, watering, um, compost building, sifting, and bedheading, and seed saving, um, I'm going to share uh, via another screen. So why don't we start with um, compost building. And I'll do that by sharing the web page that's linked to in your handout. So compost building and monitoring. Um, so this is something we had our older kids do um, because you can see they were carrying these five gallon buckets. Pacific School has a cooking kitchen um, and we cooked, the kids actually cooked the meals um, every day of the school year for a hundred plus kids. Um, and so we had a lot of kitchen scraps left over and the kitchen knew to um, save compostables and put them in the buckets and our larger kids, fourth grade and up, would carry these buckets out to our composting area. Um, they would dump the compost on and making a new layer um, on top of the pile. And then we'd use um, flat edge spades and chop that compost material up right on top of the bin, uh, on the pile, right on top of the pile. Um, and breaking up surface area makes composting um, happen faster. So they would um, use the spades to chop it up on the top. Um, and then they would cover the compost pile with a straw bale. We don't have a straw bale right next to our compost area. So we'd have those browns to cover it. They'd rinse the buckets with the hose and discard the rinse water onto the compost pile to maintain moisture. And then after that, the observations began. And so you see these kids right here, they're using a compost thermometer uh, the boy in the blue and then the girl in the purple has our compost data sheet and she's recording five different temperature areas that the kids would observe uh, the temperature of the pile over time. Um, and then in the winter time when we were not out in the garden as much, we could take that data and graph it. Um, this is another activity. I just want to show you the picture of this is um, compost sifting. So we have the black buckets um, or the, the square buckets have uh, you know holes in the bottom of them and kids are in the piles digging out the finished compost and then teams of two would sift the compost into these buckets. And um, those were nice, those were old worm bins that we were using to sift with. Um, but you can also use these nursery trays uh, that you get at the nursery. And so I'm gonna share a video and a little bit more information on um, all these composting activities, but know on this webpage, which is linked to from the page I shared at the beginning, has all the data sheets um, that are part of this particular activity. So here is an image of our compost pile record sheet. Um, they put down the date, uh, they put down what they did, um, what materials they added and any observations. And then they recorded the temperature of the center of the pile, uh, the front right corner, um, the left, front corner, um, the left back corner, and the right rear corner. And they'd measure the different temperatures uh, in the pile. Um, and now I'm going to transition and show you a little demonstration of uh, sifting compost. One of the most um, successful independent stations we had was our compost sifting station. So as you saw, we have all the kitchen scraps. So we were actively making compost. We'd also get greens from a local restaurant because we wanted to have a lot of compost and our cooking kitchen wouldn't even supply enough greens. Um, so we would get more greens from a local restaurant and our kids would compost those. So we'd always have compost ready to be sifted and this sifting station could be done at any time, early finishers or added to a station or pre-lesson activity, garden chores. Um, and all the kids knew how to sift and we just left those bigger round buckets and the smaller sifter buckets out at all times um, and kids could sift. I'm going to share a little demonstration from our, our Life Lab educator Sarah um, on how to sift. So this is just a smaller clip of a composting activity um, which is linked to as a YouTube video and all of our playlists. Uh, we have hundreds of videos on our Life Lab YouTube channel. 
Um, so let's have Sarah take it away and her and Sean can share you a little bit about how to sift compost using a nursery tray. Compost pile or your compost bins in your garden classroom provides many opportunities for engagement. One thing is to sift the finished compost into a container that then you can use to go add to your beds or other places in your garden. So one place to do that, or one way to do that, is to have kids in your garden use a trowel to scoop, put it on top of a tray, and this is a tray that is just a nursery tray that comes from your garden store. And notice I've picked out one that has small holes, not one that has too large of holes, because that's not gonna be very helpful when we're sifting. And once they have done that, then you need a buddy or a partner to do the sifting. So Sean, can you take the trowel and can you do five scoops from our finished compost area and put it right on top of this tray? Put the trowel right back in. Now, this bin is a little bit small than what's ideal. You want one that's maybe a little bit bigger or flat so that it can catch all the compost. Then you're gonna need a buddy. So Sean, can you stand on this side? We're gonna both grab the edges and we're just gonna gently shake it back and forth. Okay, and now all the big pieces are left on top, which I can put right back into the compost bin to try to decompose into smaller pieces. And then inside, we have nice compost ready to go be added to our beds. So another maintenance um, activity that we have our students do independently is seed saving in the fall when a lot of our garden cottage flowers and, and reseeding annual flowers would have the beautiful seed heads on them. We'd have those one gallon buckets and you can see um, taped to one of the buckets is the flower specimen that we were collecting. In this case, it's the red seed poppy. And so the kids would know what goes in that bucket because we'd tape that flower right onto it. And then in the bucket, we'd line it with a plastic bag and the kids would run around and pull off the dry seed heads and add them to the bucket. And so this is something that we could work as a group before our garden lessons, or once again, these could be rotation stations um, or early finisher projects. Um, the younger kids really liked doing this. Um, and I saw during garden work days and the such, kids just knew what to do. They'd grab the bucket that had the flower head on it and they'd go around and start collecting seeds. Um, and now let me show you what we did with these seeds. So with all the seeds that we collected, we then cleaned them by winnowing them. So we would um, uh, drop them into buckets and the kids would blow away all the chafe and then we'd catch the seeds. And then we'd put them in giant coin envelopes which you can get at like a um, office supply store. And our coin envelopes were uh, created um, with um, or decorated with hand-drawn uh, images of seed packets that the kids created for us. These were older students, so fourth and um, through sixth graders. And we would photocopy them and then we'd glue them onto the envelopes. And we sold our seed packets um, at the beginning of the holiday season. Um, one year, our students made $160 selling seed packets. And then of course, they're great gifts to give away to teachers and the such um, or supporters of the garden. So um, our garden had lots of flowers. There's so many things to do with flowers and always has some sort of project to do. Um, deadheading is the act of removing spent flowers and most spent flowers have seeds in them. And those are the seeds that we collected to have our seed business with. So highly, highly recommend reseeding annuals. Um, and if you go onto Life Lab's website and search reseeding annuals, you'll find some great lists of them. So the last garden maintenance chore um, is watering and it could be done anytime if you have a nice dipping bucket set up. Uh, this is a part of a video clip from our online certification course. Um, so I'll let myself take it away you know, in this video talking about uh, watering plants in. Soil, water, air, and care. Now that our transplants are in the ground, we need to water them in. 
So as an adult, what I would do is I'd use a big watering can, like one of these, and the initial watering in, what your goal to do is to soak all around the root ball. If the area you're watering starts to flood, you want to pull back a little bit and then add water once the water soaks in. Depending on your soil type, usually you need to give about three to five drinks to soak in the area around the plant root. I gave this plant four sips or little doses of water. Now that I've given the plant the water, I wanna make sure that the water has soaked in below the level of the roots. And I can do that by sticking my finger in there. Ooh, and I can feel that it's wet and gushy down there, which is good for this plant. Then I could go and water the next plant giving it three to four little sips, letting the water soak in so that it doesn't run away from the plant. Once again, watering is a slow process. You can also see why it would be advantageous when kids make those little moats around each little plant. It allows you to add a little bit more water without having the water run away from the base of the plant. As you can see, filling small watering containers with the end of the hose isn't usually the most successful, nor can a lot of kids get involved at one time. We like to use a dipping bucket, which is any type of vessel that can hold a large amount of water. You can have all your watering containers just living there, and the kids can come, dip, water, and return. You're practicing inefficiency by design and you're adding physical activity if kids have to run back and forth to get their third glass of water. These dipping containers can also work for larger um, watering containers such as a watering can. It'd be a great early finisher project or any time task to do while you're in the garden. All right. So I want to end with uh, some activities that aren't necessarily stations or rotations, minus the bouquets, which I'll talk about in detail. Um, but the things that the garden produces that the kids could harvest and take pride in and share. So those are seed packets, growing and sharing popcorn, photo frames in the garden, uh, harvesting succulents. Highly, highly recommend growing succulents in your garden. They don't take a lot of care and you can cut from them um, year after year and make little pot, potted plants and bouquets. So I'm gonna transition to the slides and show you some of this. So having a garden that has lots of succulents, uh, like the back rock garden wall here, which is now completely filled with these succulents, is an activity that kids could always harvest from and create succulents, put them in little pots, make gifts, uh, Mother's Day pots we do, we decorate them with paint or with colored pencils or crayons and then fill them with soil and put in a cutting of succulents. Um, and then having a lot of flowers in the garden is very advantageous. Um, we make bouquets um, every week that uh, we harvest up and carry them in little jars and bring them to our lunch rooms and they'd be on the table. We'd also bring them to the office. So no one would forget that we have a garden by having nice fresh flower bouquets. Um, other gifts we've done, Mother's Day bouquets. This was a mother that was a florist that taught kids to make really nice arrangements. She actually brought in extra flower material and they made really nice bouquets. Um, we took photos um, and then the kids drew frames around the photos. And then we made frames out of old pieces of lath that was falling apart in the garden. The kids glued the lath together and they all made uh, Father's Day frames. Um, and then we grew popcorn, which makes a really easy gift because you just add a label and we gave that out to all of our classroom teachers. Um, so we do have um, a whole web page. So we do have a whole web page on gifts from the garden. Um, we did a webinar on it, so we have a download that's linked to at the bit.ly slash garden stations page. Um, and we have a whole webinar on it. Our YouTube channel is filled with lots of craft type activities and what we like to call back pocket activities, which are quick and easy activities. 
um, in addition to the ones that we shared today that are uh, good for independent stations and garden care and maintenance. Hopefully you learned something new if you're ever in the Santa Cruz area or at a conference and Life Lab staff is there, we'd love to meet with you. And we wish you much success in your coming years of school gardening. Take care and we'll see you in the garden.